Thank you for joining us. Thank you to everyone who uh, plays such a big role here in our community, and certainly thank you to the Preservation Foundation for uh, leading the charge on this. And, you know, everyone who's sitting in this room understands uh, how we cherish our history, how we cherish looking back and thinking about and remembering things that have made our community what they are today. But as we also know, so many of those things that we look at in the past will influence our future. And so tonight, we're going to get a really interesting perspective on looking back, but then looking forward. And I think we'll hear some things that might challenge us, might cause us to question, but I think most importantly will cause us to say, wow, we are really lucky to be here. And we live in a tremendously special community. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. It's great to be here. Thank you for having me. I'm always a little humbled by these introductions that people give me. And I realized how you know, perilous they could be some years ago, the first time my wife showed up at one of my talks. And I was like really interested in what my wife would think about what I had to say. So I went up to her afterwards and said, so what'd you think, honey? And she says, well, that was fine, but that introduction was just ridiculous. <laughs> and she said, the only thing they didn't say about you is they didn't say you were a model husband. Now, did they? And, and I said, no, no, but that's a great idea. Maybe I'll add that. And, and she says, yeah, go home and look up the definition of the dictionary. If you look up the definition of model, it's a small replica of the real thing. <laughs> Well, uh, anyway, I work for the uh, Urban Land Institute in Washington, D.C. We are an international nonprofit uh, organization, education and resource organization devoted to fostering best practices in land use and development. Uh, we have offices in 53 U.S. cities. The director of our office in Chicago, Cindy McSherry, is here tonight. Wave your hand, Cindy. Uh, we work to provide technical assistance to communities all over the country on various land use and real estate uh, development issues. Uh, what I'm going to talk about tonight uh, in my interest in community design and community development goes back a very long way, and I like to tell a little story at the beginning about how I got interested in what we're going to talk about tonight. Uh, during the Vietnam War, I was a young lieutenant in the U.S. Army, and I had been to field artillery school and jungle warfare training, and I had orders to a small fire base in the central highlands of Vietnam. And literally one week before I'm supposed to fly to Tonsonut Air Force Base, in Saigon, I got a call from the Pentagon, and I had a colonel on the other end of the line, and he says to me, Lieutenant McMahon, do you have any interest in being reassigned to Europe? And I was like, okay, <laughs> let me think about that. I said, yes, Europe sounds very exciting. I would love to go to Europe. And I got really lucky. They sent me to Heidelberg, West Germany, which is the headquarters for the U.S. military in Europe and one of the most beautiful small cities on the planet Earth. And I was assigned as an aide to a United States general and then I spent the next two and a half years of my life traveling all over Europe in a helicopter. And that experience completely changed my life. But I didn't realize how much it would change my life until I flew home to Birmingham, Alabama, where I grew up, and I got out of the airplane and drove home, and for the first time ever, I saw the American landscape with a completely different set of eyes. Because to travel is to learn. And that's what we try to do at ULI, is to learn about what's working, what's not working, what might work better, and we're going to talk about some of those things tonight. So let's talk about your community. You live in a very special place. I'm sure I don't have to tell any of you that. And I can tell you that, you know, your, this town is very different from most of the towns that I work in. You have, you know, many more resources, uh, very much fewer challenges and problems uh, than most places. You have great history, traditions, architecture, and people. So those are all things you should be very, very proud about. But I want to say something, and that is this. There is no place in the world that stays special by accident. The world is changing faster than ever. And, you know, the world's, you know, people say in so many towns across America, I don't like change, but change is coming whether you like it or not. And the truth is, there's only really two kinds of change in the world we live in today. There's plan change, and there's unplanned change. You can anticipate the changes are coming. You can prepare for them. You can shape and direct them, or you can just let them happen. You know, as Abraham Lincoln used to say, the best way to predict the future is to create it yourself. You know, you can grow by choice, or you can grow by chance. You can accept the future you're given, or you can shape the future you want. 
And what this evening really grows out of is your comprehensive plan update. You're not required to do comprehensive planning in the state of Illinois, but it's a pretty good idea, and I'll talk a lot tonight about the value of planning, if you will, thinking about the future, creating a blueprint for the future, if you will. But you see, you know, growth is about choices. You know, should you, you know, put growth in downtown or out on a highway somewhere? And by the way, I don't really think the happy face makes that better. <laughs> but, you know, growth is about, you know, do you want to design around the needs of an automobile or around the needs of people? It's about choices. You know, it's also about our children. It's about our grandchildren. It's about the future, and it's about preparing for the future. You know, it's also about balance. It's about trying to create a sense of harmony between jobs and the environment, conservation and economic development, the old and the new, people and the land. It's also about trying to find win-win solutions to the problems that face us today. I'm one of those people who think we spend way too much time in America fighting about what we disagree about and not nearly enough time sitting down community by community to talk about what we do agree about. And I can tell you, when you do that, you find there's enormous amounts of agreement, agreement about place. I can tell you, that having traveled to every state and worked in hundreds of communities, that more people in America care, care much more about the place they live than the political party they belong to. And you can reach consensus about place. And it's the one place where we don't have the same kind of polarization we are having at the national and the and the state level. So thinking about what you agree about is kind of important. So you say, well, what's changing? And the truth is, as I said before, everything is changing. The economy is changing, demographics, technology, consumer attitudes, market trends, health care, energy sources, the weather is changing. You know, it's interesting. So we have a, a utility company in the Washington, D.C. area. It's called PEPCO, Public Electric Power Company. And for years, they used to tell us they couldn't afford to underground utility wires. Well, about two years ago, they announced they were setting aside $1 billion to start systematically undergrounding utility wires in the Washington, D.C. area. Why? Because the severe weather events are coming more frequently. The power is staying out longer. The economic losses are growing. They said we can't afford not to underground the utility wires. So that's just one of the many things that are changing. Let's talk about the economy. Yes, manufacturing is down everywhere in America, but business and professional services is up. Education and medicine are up even more. In 65 of the 100 biggest cities in America today, the largest employer is a university or a hospital. You know, I grew up in Birmingham. You know, the largest employer used to be U.S. Steel. Now it's the University of Alabama Medical Center, which employs 70,000 people. Uh, you know, the biggest employer in our state. Now let's talk about why we're losing jobs to manufacturing. And I want to suggest to you that it has a lot less to do with trade policy than it does with automation. You know, anybody been to a CVS or a Walgreens recently and seen how few cashiers there are? So really automation is, according to Forbes magazine, is the biggest cause of loss in manufacturing jobs in the country. We, we talk a lot about the, auto, you know, autonomous vehicles, driverless cars. It's coming. But, you know, we, and there's going to be a lot of positive things about that, but we need to think about things like what we're going to do with all those truck drivers that might be put out of work, or those Uber drivers, or those taxi drivers, et cetera. And so that's a discussion that many people are having in many places around the country is, what do we do about automation? You know, you can't stop technological advancement, but you can think about what we might retrain people to do. So, you know, some of you probably heard of Richard Florida. He wrote a well-known book called The Creative Class. He has another book out now called The Great Reset. He says, how we live, work, move, move around, shop, it's going to change. And that communities that embrace the future will prosper. Those that do not will decline. Did you know that two-thirds of all American small towns are losing population? And a lot of those because they haven't thought about the future. They haven't thought about it. Of course, they don't have the kind of assets that you might have or you do have. But, you know, there's another third of the small towns that are growing. And those are what I call the successful communities in America. And they have a few things in common, which we'll talk about later. You know, there's a big sort going on in America. When I got out of college, college graduates were evenly distributed throughout the United States based on population density. There was the same percentage pretty much everywhere. That's no longer true. Today, college graduates are clustering in major metropolitan areas in certain cool small cities and towns. 
So you go to Austin, Texas, or Raleigh, Durham, or Washington, D.C., or Boston, or Seattle, and you'll find that 45% of everybody's got a college degree or higher. But you go to West Virginia, it's 17%. You go to Las Vegas, it's 18%. So, you know, there's a big sort going on. So one of your challenges is how do you attract and retain talented young people? And we'll talk some more about that. Economic development is also about choices. You know, you want to try to recruit, you know, some new industry, or you want to try to grow the jobs that you already have. You know, it's interesting, sort of this competition for jobs in America. We have thousands, thousands of counties and almost 30,000 incorporated communities all fighting for a relative handful of plants, factories, or distribution centers we build any more in America to do anything. So the question becomes, well, you know, sort of what should you focus on in terms of economic development? I can tell you that the economic development model is changing, and it's certainly changing in rural and small town America. When I was growing up, the economic development model for rural Alabama was, let's just widen all the highways. And then we lined line the highways with a bunch of junk, and we called that economic development. You know, but I want to tell you, economic development is no longer about, you know, cheap land and, you know, low taxes and cheap labor. Today it's about high value places. It's about highly trained talent. It's not about what you don't have. It's about what you do have. And I can tell you that in the economy in the world today, quality of life is critically important, where we didn't really care about that in the past. And I want to suggest to you that the most important infrastructure investment in the future is not roads. It is education. Education. So, you know, let's think about how we've done things for years. So, you know, Everybody used to think that economic development was always about the one big thing. So let's start it, you know, with convention centers. So, that, you know, one city after another, they had an arms race to build the biggest convention center. And then it was festival marketplaces, which worked fine in, you know, Baltimore and in Boston. But did you know there were 19 other cities that built festival marketplaces that went bankrupt within three years, like Toledo, Ohio, or Jacksonville, Florida, or Norfolk, Virginia? You know, it was all... And then there was aquariums, if you know... This is, uh, you know, New Jersey said if we could just build an aquarium featuring the fish of New Jersey, <laughs> that we could save Camden, New Jersey. They build, did build that aquarium. It's a beautiful aquarium. But did it save Camden, New Jersey? No, it did not. And the reason, of course, is because successful economic development is rarely about the one big thing. Much more frequently, it's about lots of smaller things working synergistically together off of a plan that makes sense for you and your community. You know, and let's think about where most of our job creation is occurring. It's not in big business, it's in small business. And even in a place like the largest research park in America, the Research Triangle Park in Raleigh, you know, the vast majority of jobs are actually in small businesses, not big businesses. But the irony is all of our economic incentives go to big businesses. So this is a great story. This is the uh, Lockheed Martin uh, headquarters, well, one of their headquarters, in, also in Camden, New Jersey. New Jersey has a program, economic development program called Grow New Jersey. They've given out $1.1 billion to 16 companies to basically move into places like Camden. And so they gave the Lockheed Martin company $107 million dollars to move 250 employees from Cherry Hill, New Jersey, five miles away into Camden, New Jersey. $107 million, that's almost $400,000 per employee. And they didn't create a single new job. They didn't employ a single person from Camden. The building is surrounded by a huge parking lot with a chain link fence around it. And you're paying no property taxes for 10 years. Okay, so that's kind of what we've been thinking about as calling economic development. Well, I want to ask you, do you think that model makes more sense? Or do you think creating a great place and working to develop a skilled workforce makes more sense? When all you're doing is giving away money to big companies, you're actually pitting one community against another. You're just simply moving economic activity around. When, when you're actually investing in your community, you're creating lasting assets that create value long afterwards. So, you know, it's interesting. So I, uh, I have two brothers that live in Mobile, Alabama, and they decided they had to have a cruise ship terminal. 
and they decided to spend $80 million to build a cruise ship terminal on the Mobile River, which of course is one of their most important assets. But interestingly, in downtown Mobile, you really can't get to the Mobile River because they built all these other like industrial things around it. So the one place left, you could reach the, the river. They put a quarter mile long concrete parking garage, $80 million parking garage to attract a cruise ship company. And the, the Carnival Cruise Ship Company did come. They stayed one year. So they got a better offer from New Orleans. And then they left. And now you still can't get to the river, which was one of the most important assets. So think about this when you're thinking about economic development. So let's talk about another change, demographics. We're getting older, we're getting younger, we're getting more diverse. The fastest growing form of household in America is a single person living alone. A single person living alone. But you know what the irony of this is we built housing in America for 40 years like every single family was the Waltons. The mom, the dad, the two kids, and the dog. That's only 25% of American households today. 75% of all households today in America do not have school-aged children. And who is that? It's empty nesters, it's retirees, it's unrelated singles living together, it's young professionals, it's single people, on and on and on. You know, so the world is changing. Let's talk about young people. Well, they're, you know, getting married later or not at all. They're postponing home ownership in many cases. They drive less and they own fewer cars. Did you know that 25 years ago, 90% of all 19-year-olds in the United States had a driver's license? Today, it's 67%. A quarter of all people 20 years old in America don't even know how to drive a car. And we'll talk about some of the reasons why that is, because for many young people, mobility is more important than ownership of a car. And, you know, their ticket to freedom, unlike me when I was growing up, was a car. Now it's their cell phone. And now it's all the social media and things like they do. And why do you think we have services like Uber and Lyft and car share and bike share? And, by the way, did you know that car share membership is growing by the rate of 32% a year in the United States? Bicycling is now the fastest growing form of transportation in America by far. Nothing else is even close. You know, young people are thinking about getting around different ways. And, as I said before, they're concentrating in major metropolitan areas and in some cool, small cities and towns. They favor walkable neighborhoods. Not just, they don't all want to live in the city. They don't want to all live in the Chicago's and Washington's. But the suburbs of the future, the successful suburbs, will be suburbs that have a little bit of the city in them, that have a walkable, compact, mixed-use downtown, some place where they can go and walk around and they can see other people. Because as... The great sociologist William White used to say the greatest way to attract people is to let them look at other people, you know. It's interesting, sort of the, one of the silver bullets of walkability in America has been sidewalk cafes. Let me just give you an example. So 1995, there were no sidewalk cafes anywhere in the city of Philadelphia. They were prohibited. Ten years later, there were 4,400 outdoor cafe tables. And Center City, Philadelphia was the fastest growing zip code in all of Pennsylvania. You know, people like to check out what other people are doing. Let's talk about the death of distance. You can run a business anywhere in the world today. So, you know, if you can't differentiate Lake Forest, Illinois, from any other place, you have simply no competitive advantage, which is why successful economic development, as I said before, is about asset-based economic development, thinking about what you have and growing those assets. You know, and... Let's give you an example. I talked about quality of life. Some of you may have heard of Foster Freeze. In 2012, he was Rick Santorum's number one campaign contributor. He sat out the most recent election. But he a, runs a mutual fund company called the Brandywine Investment Group. And for about 40 years, this company founded by his father was headquartered in Valley Forge, Pennsylvania, busy suburb of Philadelphia. But he likes to fly fish. So every summer, he's fly out to Jackson, Wyoming, Jackson Hole, Wyoming, to go fly fishing. And then one day, he's stuck in traffic on the Schuylkill Expressway, and all of a sudden, a light bulb goes on in his mind and says, hey, I can run a mutual fund company anywhere in the world. And he picks up his entire company and he moves it into downtown Jackson, Wyoming. That's the largest private sector employer in Jackson today, 450 finance professionals working in downtown Jackson. Why is he there? Access to outdoor recreation. Who would have thought that was an economic development driver? But it's interesting, the state of Montana 
did an economic development study of the three Montana counties that abut Yellowstone National Park over a five-year period. And they said, well, why'd you move here? And they interviewed everybody from doctors to small manufacturers to people like Foster Freeze. And the number one reason on the list was the beauty of the region. The beauty of the region. You know, it's so interesting because if 20 years before, if you had suggested to the Bozeman County commissioners that they do something like to preserve the beauty of the region, like, for example, to prohibit billboards or have a sign ordinance, they would have said, oh, that's bad for business. Turns out it's exactly the opposite. It's incredibly good for business. Let's talk about consumer attitudes and market trends. So here's a front page story from USA Today, which is about the fact that the average amount of time that Americans have been spending at an enclosed mall or a strip center has been going down for years. People go to buy what they want and they leave, which is, you know, why part of the retail world has changed. We've, you know, we, we've closed about 15 to 20 percent of our malls and many of the others are being repositioned, turned inside out, having housing put on top. The best malls are still doing very well, uh, but the, you know, the smaller, less successful malls are transitioning to something different. Let me show you an example. So this is Rockville, Maryland. I live in Montgomery County, one house outside of Washington, D.C. And this is our county seat. And in 1970, in our infinite wisdom, we decided to tear down the entire downtown of Rockville, Maryland <laughs> and to replace it with this 200-store mall called the Rockville Mall. But guess what? They've now torn the mall down, put the downtown back. <laughs> and that's kind of a metaphor for American life, right? We're, you know, you know, we had a concept for development in America for about 300 years, and we called it a town. And towns always had a mix of uses and housing types. They were always walkable and pedestrian friendly. They were architecturally coherent and interesting. And then, you know, starting about 1960, we just forgot that model, and we created a new one we called Sprawl. And we segregated every use, and we required a car to drive everywhere for everything. It was architecturally chaotic and ugly, you know, but... We've realized now that the small towns of America, they're not a charming anachronism, just a they're actually a model for how we could build in the future. And so we'll talk about one of some of the reasons why mixed-use development is coming back. And as I said before, this idea of the old one-size-fits-all model, whether it's for residential development or commercial development, simply doesn't work in a world where there's so many different kinds of people who want so many different kinds of things, and particularly different kinds of housing. So in virtually every major market in America, we have an oversupply of that. Large lot, single family housing, and an undersupply of everything else. You know, how in-town housing, apartments, small lot housing, senior housing, cottages, bungalows, sort of, you name it. So if you want to build a community around just the one size fits all, you won't be very successful in the future. Let's talk about some of the imperatives, let's sort of repeat those. I think there are four keys to success going forward. One is smart people. How do you attract and retain smart people? Two is innovation, the ability to generate new ideas and businesses, create a small business incubator, create co-working spaces, etc. Places where people and ideas can easily mix. And that's the relates to the third one. You know, and oftentimes the place where it's easiest for people and ideas to mix is in our downtowns. And so you're creating opportunities to get together to share ideas is pretty important. But the last thing I want to spend a lot of time talking about is this last one, distinctiveness, the unique characteristics of a place. I want to suggest to you that successful communities will be distinctive communities. Some of you probably heard this slogan, keep Austin weird, or keep Albuquerque quirky. Well, you know, it turns out that's not just a funny slogan, they think it's an economic development imperative. They think it means keep us on the cutting edge, keep us sharp, make it, we're unusual, we're different, unique. Would you rather invest in those kind of communities or those are just the same, they're usual, ordinary, not special, etc. Even the World Bank has a new publication out, it's called The Economics of Uniqueness, and they make the same point in many different ways that sameness is not a plus in the world we live in today, it is a minus. And as I said before, if you can't differentiate your product, your project, your community from anybody else in a world where capital is footloose, you're not going to have any competitive advantage. You know, Joe Courtright, who works for the CEOs for Cities, summed it up pretty well. He said, unique characteristics of a place may be the only truly defensible source of competitive advantage for cities and towns. So, you know, 
historic buildings. We're not building many more of them anymore, right? So saving historic buildings is kind of important to preserving your distinctiveness and giving you, or preserving a waterfront like your lakefront here, things like that, that set you apart and make you special. So, you know, uh, Mark Twain, I love this quote from Mark Twain. He said, you know, we take stock of a city like we take stock of a man. The clothes or appearance are the externals by which we judge. Let's talk about a community's front door, its gateway. Just like with meeting a person, a good first impression is important, and a bad first impression is hard to change. You think you'd rather go to the town of Franklin, Tennessee, or the town of Midfield, Alabama? Which one looks more like a community with a sense of pride and a sense of place? Which one looks more like a community you would rather spend time or money in? If you don't remember anything else I say tonight, remember this. The image of a community is fundamentally important to its economic well-being. And what do I mean by that? What I mean is every single day in America, people make decisions about where to live, where to invest, where to vacation, where to retire, based on what our communities look like. What they look like. Let's talk about tourism for a second. Tourism is sort of important because it is the biggest industry in the world. It is the first, second, or third largest industry in every American state. So this is the official travel guide for the state of Oregon. Check out their slogan, Oregon, things look different here. Can you imagine a state travel brochure that says something like, Illinois, things look the same here? <laughs> well, of course not, because who'd want to go there, right? The more any community in America comes to look exactly like every place else, the less reason there is to visit. On the other hand, the more a community does to enhance its uniqueness, whether that's architectural or artistic or historical, whatever, the more people want to go there, because that's exactly what tourism is. It's about visiting places that are different, unusual, and unique. If every place was just like every place else, there'd be simply no reason to travel any place. So once again, the image of the community is pretty important. And think about it in relationship to the world we live in in terms of jobs and economic development. It used to be it was all about markets. Now it's all about place. Young people make are making decisions about where they want to live first and then they're looking for a job, which is a complete turnaround from the way we did it 30 years ago. You know, and you know, the National Association of Realtors says, the place is becoming more important than the product. What they mean by that is a couple of things. First of all, they, they mean that what's going on outside of a house is often more important than what's going on inside of a house. And they'll tell us that the character of a neighborhood is much more important than the size of a lot. You know, would you rather live in a nice neighborhood or simply have a big lot? So we were talking tonight about at dinner about two of the high-priced neighborhoods in the Washington, D.C. area, Georgetown and Old Town Alexandria. Did you know that Georgetown has 22 units an acre and Old Town Alexandria has 40 units an acre and all the houses cost at least a million and a half dollars? And why are these people paying a million and a half dollars or two million dollars for a 200-year-old house? Is that because they want to do home repair? No. Because <laughs> people pay a lot of money for charm and walkability. Because yeah, cr we haven't created much of that. There's a supply-demand imbalance between communities that supply walkability and charm and those that don't. In fact, you know, we've been doing these studies that uh, George Washington University just came out with a study called on walkable urbanism, comparing suburban home values in the suburbs of Washington, D.C., and they're finding that the suburbs with a walkable, compact, mixed-use center are commanding real estate values 100% higher than those that aren't. So Reston, Virginia is 25 miles out of D.C. Sterling, Virginia is 25 miles out of D.C. Reston's getting real estate prices 100% higher because they're a walkable, mixed-use, transit-served suburb, and Sterling's a drive-everywhere-for-everything suburb. You know, Mick Cornette, who's the mayor of uh, Oklahoma City, he says, economic development is really the result of creating places that people want to be. Place-making, well, Talk some more about that. You know, the Knight Foundation, which got their money from the Knight Ritter newspaper chain, they did this study about five years ago called the Soul of the City, Soul of the Community Study. And they said they found that and they looked at the 42 cities where they had Knight Ritter newspapers, and they found that communities with the strongest attachment to place had the strongest economies. And so what they said, then they said, well, what is it that attaches people to place? 
Well, first it was places to meet and mingle with your neighbors, social places, social offerings, entertainment venues, etc. Openness, how welcoming a community was to newcomers. Well, that's interesting because, you know, I was, last year I was in a small southern city and somebody said to me, you know, we're very welcoming to people who aren't different. <laughs> well, I want to suggest to you that the most successful communities of the future will be places that are open that are welcoming to all people, not just people who aren't different. And the last thing they found was community aesthetics. What a community looked like was what created attachment to place which fostered economic development. So I want to suggest there are a few things you might want to think about. What I call the dimensions of uniqueness. Anchor institutions, a vital downtown, historic buildings and neighborhoods, parks and green space, arts and culture, architecture and community design, local stores and restaurants, emphasis local. Do you know if you spend a dollar in a local business, that'll circulate through your community at a rate three times more than if you spend a dollar in a chain store? So, you know, you go, you spend a dollar to Walmart, most of that money's going to end up in Bentonville, Arkansas. Spend a dollar in a local retailer, and that's because they have a local attorney, a local accountant, a local advertising firm, et cetera, et cetera. Not to say I'm against change or big business, but you know, local business is something we ought to be thinking about, the value of. Anchor institutions, very important. You've got a couple. You've got a hospital and you have a, a college, we're a beautiful campus where we are tonight. Some anchor institutions have been much more helpful to communities than others. So let me give you an example. So the two biggest recipients of federal research dollars in the U.S. are John Hopkins University, number one, $2 billion in federal money every year. Stanford University, number two, one point nine billion dollars every year. But think about what Stanford has done versus what John Hopkins has done. Stanford figured out a way to commercialize their research and they've created the Silicon Valley, one of the great job creators in world history. But John Hopkins, on the other hand, they didn't really care what was going on in the city of Baltimore. They didn't really, you know, pay attention. They didn't really, they weren't creating research for the outside world. They were all about what was going on inside that university. And Baltimore has been a very struggling city as a result of that. Now they're investing billions of dollars outside their campus. Anybody ever been to the John Hopkins Hospital? Seen what kind of neighborhood they were in? They thought it didn't matter what kind of neighborhood they were in. Now they're building housing for all their employees because they knew it really made a big difference. So engaging with your anchor institutions and creating sort of a mutual benefit society can be very helpful. We talked about this idea of co-working spaces and incubator spaces, you know, giving young people a place to get together with other bright young people, giving them just a desk or a table to work at and a, and a phone line so they don't have to pay for a big office. Healthy downtowns. Why are downtowns important? Well, because first and foremost, if you don't have a healthy downtown, you simply don't have a healthy town. You know, downtowns are the heart and soul of any community. You know, we realized some years ago that it was kind of hard to be a suburb of nothing. <laughs> you know, and it's true, the apple rots from the inside out. Check out this slogan. This is a, a business development magazine. This is essentially for, you know, uh, industrial park developers. And that, notice the headline. It says, when site searching the south, ensure you inspect a community's downtown first. So why would an industrial park developer even care about a downtown? Because the downtown says so much about the rest of the community. It is the icon upon which people will judge whether this is a good place to live or invest. And so that investing in downtown is pretty darn important. It plays a real decisive role in a regional economy, in a community economy, etc. So, and I'm sure you believe that. And the world is actually moving back downtown. Christian Wakefield has a new study out identifying 500 major American community companies that have moved back downtown in the last five years. You know, like... General Electric or Motorola or Quicken Loans. And I could go on and on. And you say, well, why did you move back downtown? And here's what they'll, well, uh-oh, where did I lose one? Uh, and they say, this is why we moved, to attract and retain talented workers. I was in Normal, Bloomington, Illinois, earlier this week. And they're very worried that State Farm is going to leave. That's where their headquarters is now. That they're either going to go to Tempe, Arizona, or move up to Chicago. You know, Caterpillar just announced they're moving 300 people from Peoria into Chicago. Marriott's been on an office park on the Washington Beltway for 40 years. They just announced they're moving to a metro stop. Why? To attract and retain 
talented workers who want to be in the middle of it all. So here's a great example. This is Amazon's new campus. It's not a corporate campus. It's the heart of downtown Seattle. They moved 7,000 people into downtown Seattle. It used to be the only way you could get to Amazon was drive your car. Now you can drive a car there if you want to, or you can take the bus, you can take the train, you can take a boat, you can ride a skateboard, you can ride your bicycle, or you can walk there. And at the end of the day, you're in the middle of it all, which is part of why they moved there. And I want to say that this is going on not just in big cities, but it's going on in small towns too. This is where my daughter lives. This is Frederick, Maryland. And, you know, literally 1985, nobody lived in downtown Frederick. And in fact, they had a huge flood along something called the Carroll Creek. And the mayor then decided he wanted to put in a river walk, kind of a small town version of the San Antonio River Walk. And people laughed at him. So that's a, you know, we can't, we can't afford that. You know, guess what? They put that in. Now downtown, 20 years later, has 5,000 residents, 800 businesses, 200 restaurants and retailers. It is the fastest growing city in the state of Maryland. You know, and it all began with an investment in themselves. Why would anybody invest in a community that wouldn't invest in itself? You know, particularly in a world, as I said before, that's, we're capitalist footloose. Let's talk about historic buildings, neighborhoods, and landscapes. Why are these places important? Well, I want to suggest, because first of all, because a city without a past is like a man without a memory. I want to suggest to you, and some of you have probably read some of Thomas Wolfe's famous novels, like Look Homeward Angel. You know, he's the guy who penned the immortal line, You Can't Go Home Again. Well, sadly, Tom Wolfe, he can't go home again because here's the site of his original house in this parking lot in Asheville, North Carolina. You know, Daniel Webster once wrote, he said, quote, the man who feels no sentiment or veneration for the memory of his forefathers is himself unworthy of kindred regard and remembrance. At its essence, saving the historic buildings of a community is about saving the heart and soul of a community. But it's also incredibly important to your economic well-being as well. So the Main Street program, probably pound for pound, dollar for dollar, the most successful economic development project program we've ever had in the United States, which required no public subsidies whatsoever, uh, has really been about you know, historic preservation at the basis of economic development. Let me show you a couple of examples. So this used to be the fire station in a small town in southern Wisconsin, Sheboygan Falls, Wisconsin. And many years ago, they were going downhill like so many small towns, and they brought in the Main Street program, and they started working with them. And one of the four principles is, you know, restoring the design integrity and restoring the facades of historic buildings. So they did that. It tells the story about the history of the building, but guess what else happened? Sales of pizza almost doubled. And it maintained that over a multi-year period. So let me show you a couple of nationally famous examples. So welcome to New Orleans. So I spent a lot of time in New Orleans after Hurricane Katrina. The Urban Land Institute was brought in to put together a redevelopment plan for New Orleans. And so they said, we don't want just a physical redevelopment plan. We want an economic redevelopment plan, too. So we said, of course, you know, well, what, what's your biggest industries? Are, is it seafood? Is it sugar? Is it chemical? Is it the oil industry? He said, no. The biggest industry in all of Louisiana is the tourism industry, number one. What's the engine of that industry? It's called the French Quarter. But did you know that for 40 years, the Louisiana Department of Transportation wanted to put a freeway through the middle of the French Quarter? Ladies and gentlemen, that is more important and more valuable than any plant, factory, or distribution center in the entire state of Louisiana. But people didn't really understand that. Let's, let's go over to San Antonio, Texas, and visit the San Antonio Riverwalk, the number one destination in the entire state of Texas. It's the basis of that city's multi-billion dollar year annual tourism industry, and it's the single defining characteristic of the city. But most people don't know that at one point in the past, the city of San Antonio thought so little of that small river, they actually wanted to put it underground into a culvert. Today, it's the most visited place in Texas. Let's fly out to Seattle and go to the Pike Place Farmer's Market. It's the number one destination in all of Washington State. Millions of people go there every year. And yet, once again, a couple of, you know, 30 years ago, a couple of people on the Seattle City Council said, well, no, we have to tear down the Pike Place Market. Why? They said, well, we need more downtown parking. Like, parking for what? You can have all the parking in the world. If there's nothing to do, no one's ever going to want to go there. 
If you have a parking problem, it means you're successful. So parking is important, but it's not as important as having places that people would want to go to. Let's go down to Florida. Yes, Disney World is the number one destination in Florida. What is number two? Well, there it is. It's called the Art Deco Historic District in South Miami Beach. It's the largest collection of Art Deco buildings in North America. They were all going to be torn down. You know, now people come from all over the world to visit this place. I'll never forget the first time I took my 20-something children to Miami, and we, I wanted to get them out to the Everglades, and we were staying at this hotel in South Beach. No, Dad, I want to stay here. I don't want to go out to the Everglades. You know, Everglades are pretty cool, but this is, they thought, was even cooler. Let's talk about the Camden Yards Baseball Stadium in Baltimore, probably the most influential sports stadium ever built in North America, not just because it was a new stadium, but because it was the first of the so-called retro stadiums. It did the best job of integrating new construction with the historic buildings and neighborhoods that surrounded that site. It was a good neighbor. You know, I'll show you some of the things they did. So if you notice the field is actually 16 feet below the street level. Why did they do that? So the stadium wouldn't tower over the row houses that surround the stadium. So thinking about how new might fit in with old is actually kind of important. You know, Arthur Fromer sums it up pretty well. He says, among cities and towns with no particular recreational appeal, those that preserve their past continue to enjoy tourism. Tourists simply won't go to a city or town that's lost its soul. So there's so many ways that the place that you live in affects your economic well-being. Let's talk about some of the changes in terms of older buildings and real estate. So we do a study every year called Emerging Trends in Real Estate. And last year, we found that restored industrial buildings were commanding higher rents than new Class A office space in the United States. Why? Well, first of all, because creative class businesses like to be in cool space. And they like these big old warehouses and factory buildings because they can move things around very easily. There's a lot of flexibility in that. So, you know, we're starting to see many more projects like this. I saw many this morning in a tour of, in Chicago. Let's talk about hotel chains. So the hotel industry has found that in the millennial generation that authenticity and interesting are more important than comfortable and predictable in lodging facilities, which is why all the hotel chains are you know, creating these off-brands. You, know, the, you know, there's this funny slogan about Holiday Inn. People used to say the best thing about Holiday Inn was no surprises. The worst thing about Holiday Inn was no surprises. <laughs> and so now we're seeing hotel chains starting to restore historic buildings all over America. This is a Hampton Inn in Lexington, Virginia. They restored the old manor house. That's where you check in. That's where you have your breakfast, etc. The motel is designed. No, that's a Fairfield Inn in Keene, New Hampshire. Marriott says that this year about 20% of all their new courtyards in Marriott in the United States will be in restored historic buildings. And many of them will be in our downtowns because young people don't want to stay out on the highway. They want to stay in the downtown. And there's so many small cities in America that don't have a downtown hotel. And so you want to think about economic development, think about a downtown hotel. But I want to suggest to you the most important question for many places is not what, how to preserve the best of the past, because I think we're mostly in favor of that. But I think a probably a, maybe even more important question is what are we building today that will be worth preserving in the future? What buildings will your children and your grandchildren fight to save 50 years from now? And I ask that question for a couple of reasons. First of all, because 80% of everything ever built in America has been built since about 1950. You know, and a lot of it is just plain junk, like this Kentucky Fried Chicken franchise with the red plastic Mansonard roof. It's also important because, as Winston Churchill once wrote, he said, quote, the man who feels, I mean, excuse me, um, he said, we shape our buildings and then our buildings shape us. And, you know, it's really true how, you know, what kind of we're building affects whether we can even have a sense of community. So we need to think more about how new construction might enhance community character. You know, we live in a nation of highly varied history, climate, culture, and terrain. And so many communities look like they're being built with Legos, you know, interchangeable parts. Ask yourself this question. Do you think every chain store and franchise in America has to look exactly alike, whether it's in Maine or Maryland, Missouri, Montana, or Lake Forest, Illinois? And the answer to that is, of course not. No, any building can fit in with a community. 
that's a new McDonald's. It's in a small town in eastern Long Island. And, you know, it's ironic because prospective brides go here to pose for their bridal photographs, not something you'd say every day about a McDonald's in America. You know, but, you know, but this is actually going on all over the world. So this is a McDonald's in the town of Stowe, Vermont. It looks like a New England-style building. Why is that? Because it's in New England. Don't you think buildings in one part of America and the world ought to be different from buildings in another part? of the world? Shouldn't a McDonald's in New England be different from one in the desert southwest? And shouldn't one in the desert southwest be different from one in the southeast? And shouldn't a McDonald's in a small town in North Carolina be different from one in a small town in Maryland or different from a small town in Maine? By the way, this is the first McDonald's in America that went into an historic building. That's in Freeport, Maine. That's where the L.L. Bean Company is headquartered. That's called the Gore House. It was built in 1833. And in 1980, so what is that now? 30 seven years ago, uh, McDonald's optioned this site. They wanted to tear down that house and put in their typical suburban style McDonald's. And the town of Freeport said no. And McDonald's sued them and they lost. And then they sued them a second time and then they lost again. But guess what? Three years later, a picture of that McDonald's appeared in their annual corporate report as an example of their good community stewardship. And I want to tell you, they're not suing anybody for this anymore. They're doing this all over the world, but only in communities that are savvy enough to say, I want something that fits with my town. I don't want your off-the-shelf model. What you need to know is that every chain store and franchise in America has plan A, plan B, and plan C. And what gets built depends on you. You know, it's kind of like the good witch of the West said in The Wizard of Oz, you have the power. You've always had the power. You know, it's so interesting, I go to these small towns out west and I say, how'd you like it if the federal government came into town, told you what the town's going to look like? It'd be like, get the guns, we're going to (laughs) fight. But you let these multinational corporations come in and tell you what your town's going to look like? You don't have to accept that. You know, what's more important? You know, should the character of your town shape the new development? Should the new development shape the character of the town? How you answer that question will determine what kind of town you'll have in the future. And, you know, it can apply to anything. So, you know, as you're off-the-shelf Walgreen, there's a, maybe a better Walgreen, and here's another Walgreens. You know, Plan C. And every Plan C is different because every place is different. You know, so, and it applies, and I could show you hundreds of samples of this kind of thing. And, you know, even Walmart. So, that's the old paradigm, right? Let me show you the, the new paradigm. So, here's our brand-new Walmart in Washington, D.C. Okay, it's in a five-story, brand-new building. Okay, there's a swimming pool on the roof. There's 200 apartments above the Walmart. The Walmart actually has real windows that let real sunlight into the floor of the building. Wow, that's a first in America. You say, where's the parking? Well, the parking is under the building. And by the way, they don't need as much parking anyway because if you live in a city, you know how often an average person goes to the grocery store in a city? Four times a week, buying prepared food. and getting what they're going to have for dinner that night. We have people, and there's a metro stop a block away, by the way. So this is actually going on all over the country now. So there's a Target in Minneapolis, and there's a Target in Chicago, and here's a, you know, Target's actually buying up old department stores and restoring them. That's like the Carson Prairie Scott building in downtown Chicago, or the Galleria building in downtown Portland. There's a new Home Depot in New York City. I showed this to some group last year, and somebody said, well, how do you get your lumber home? And it was like, (laughs) well, they deliver. Well, there's a concept. How about that? So, you know, all the old models are changing. And part of the reason they're changing is because there's only one place left with more spending power than stores in America. It's in our downtowns. Because for 40 years, all our retail was built out on the highway outside of our downtowns. And so now we're getting, you know, grocery stores and mixed-use buildings, small footprints, multi-story buildings, restored historic buildings, et cetera, et cetera. You know, grocery stores, the biggest change I've ever seen is grocery stores. So when I first moved to D.C. to go to law school many years ago, we had two inner city grocery stores. They were both Safeways. We call one the Soviet Safeway because it didn't have any food and you had to wait in line for what little there was. The other one was in Georgetown. We called that the social Safeway because of the hot dating scene that occurred there. Now we got 34 urban grocery stores. 34. Not one has a parking lot in front of it. Not one. Uh, Where's the parking? Well, it's under the building, on top of the building, behind the building. It's always, you know, and and then they're in multi-story. We have grocery stores with escalators in them. 
You know, so interesting, years ago, we got the first multi-story Target in America in Gaithersburg, Maryland. And the big issue was, well, how do you get the shopping cart up and down? Well, of course, we did put a man on the moon. We probably could figure out how to get the shopping carts up and down. And they have escalators for your shopping cart. It goes right up and down next to you. So now Target has hundreds of downtown multi-story stores. And, you know, nationwide, this is the new promised land. You know, we, you remember that old Joni Mitchell song about paved paradise and put in a parking lot? Well, now, one of our greatest redevelopment opportunities is those parking lots, you know, that on these deteriorating commercial corridors. You don't really, you know, you've done a great job of corridor preservation in this community, but so many communities have these underperforming strips everywhere, and they're a good place for redevelopment because you've got all the infrastructure in place there. And, you know, this is where you can put your multifamily housing. Did you know that the majority of all housing being built in the city of Los Angeles today is being built on commercially zoned land? along the Ventura boulevards of Los Angeles. They're taking these crappy commercial strips and creating a place. Retail down here and housing up there. And I understand that's not for everybody. You know, everybody doesn't want to sleep upstairs and shop downstairs, but once again, there's an undersupply of that kind of housing and an oversupply of other kinds. So this is what we're seeing. So there's your Best Buy spread out, single use drive only. Here's another Best Buy. You know, so, you know, compact, mixed use, or walkable. And you say, well, I couldn't do that in a small town. Well, maybe you could do something like this. This is a brand new Dairy Queen in the small town of Herndon, Virginia. It has a dentist office upstairs. How appropriate. <laughs> you know, and by the way, who'd you live, rather live next door to anyway? A house full of out of control teenagers or a dentist office? Which one would have a greater impact on your quiet enjoyment of your property? It's not, the, you know, it's not the use, it's the impact of the use. So let's talk about another key to distinctiveness, green space, parks. So there's literally hundreds of studies that shows that green space increases the value of adjacent property. So classic example, where's the most valuable land in New York City? Well, there it is. It's the land next to Central Park. But, you know, parks, you know, can create enormous value. So Millennium Park, you know, there have been studies that show that Millennium Park, even though it costs a lot of money, has created billions of dollars in real estate value around it. It's now the leading tourist attraction in the state of Illinois. Uh, it's got thousands of new units of housing, et cetera. But you can even use that in a small town. So this is Sulphur Springs, Texas, beautiful courthouse. They have great courthouses in Texas. But like so many small towns, this was a town that was going nowhere. And the only time they used the courthouse square was on for the 4th of July. So what did they do? Well, they put in a splash pad, and people started coming downtown every single day. Now they have 300 events a year downtown, and all the retail in the square has come back to life because people are all going back downtown now every day. You know, or how about this? This is Rapid City, South Dakota. You know, this was kind of the heart of their downtown. Well, they took that parking lot out and created a place for people. And in the winter, that's an ice skating rink, by the way. So it gets year-round. They have outdoor movies here. They have events. They have Zumba classes. They have health fairs, sort of you name it. Arts and culture, museums, theaters, playhouses, art galleries, festivals, murals, public art. One of the things that hit me today in our tour is how much history you have here, how interesting this community is, the people who have lived here, the things that have happened here. But I want to suggest to you you need to make the story of this community manifest in the landscape. You need to think about how to use interpretive displays and historic markers and public art to do that. So, you know, a lot of communities, you know, you, you've had a lot of famous people live here. So Dolly Parton, all her cleavage and all, she's on the downtown square in Sevierville, Tennessee. And we put a, a sculpture for Thurgood Marshall in his hometown of Annapolis, Maryland. And, you know, so you can celebrate famous people, uh, you know, Babe Ruth, William Faulkner, Buddy Holly, you name it, or famous events like the Great Depression in Washington, D.C., or the lunch counter sit-ins in Greensboro, North Dakota. By the way, this is probably the most popular sculpture in all of D.C., and every time you go there, if you go to the Franklin Memorial, uh, Franklin Roosevelt Memorial, you see all these tourists lined up in the bread line with the, with the statues, and they're having their pictures uh, taken with it. But you say, well, you know, Maybe we don't have famous people. Well, you've all got ordinary people, the people that made this community what it is. So maybe you could celebrate them. And, you know, so it might be the watermen in Massachusetts or the ranchers in Wyoming, the coal miners in Pennsylvania, or even the commuters in Seattle. 
That's a sculpture called Waiting for the Inner Urban. It used to be a streetcar line. It went right down that street. They're waiting for it. And it's not coming, but they don't really seem to care. It's become a placemaker. It tells a story about the history of the neighborhood. And then when you do that, it helps people appreciate what their community was and where it came from. And you create a greater sense of stewardship. Tell your story. This is the Chisholm Trail mural in downtown Fort Worth, Texas. And, you know, Fort Worth was founded because of the cattle drives. And by the way, this parking lot is no longer a parking lot. Now it's Sundance Square, the best park in downtown Fort Worth. This is the little town I live in. This is Tacoma Park, Maryland. That is our family album. Each one of those pictures is important to the history of our town. And there's a little thing over here that will tell you about the, each of the things. But, for example, that's the Wiley's Ice Cream Parlor that was the inspiration for the television show Happy Days. And so each of these things tells a story about our community. So this is the Yankee Flyer Diner mural in Nashua, New Hampshire. Yankee Flyer Diner was an institution in Nashua, and it burned down, and they wanted to bring it back to life. So how'd they pay for the mural? Well, all the people you see in that mural are actually real people who live in Nashville, New Hampshire today, and they all paid to have their pictures put in there. So if there's a will, there's a way to do things. So let's talk about, you know, the biggest baseball bat in America is in downtown Louisville. Well, it makes sense because that's where they make all the baseball bats that are used in the major leagues. Or, you know, who knew that there was an old Orlando until you saw the big postcard in downtown Orlando that tells you the history of Orlando. Or the radio flyer wagon in Spokane, Washington, where they used to manufacture radio flyer wagons. So now they got a piece of playground equipment, a piece of public art, and something that tells you about the history of the community. Did you know that all the street lights in Hershey, Pennsylvania are Hershey Kisses? <laughs> you know, and sometimes, you know, public art doesn't always have to tell a story. Sometimes it can just be fun and whimsical and interesting and exciting and every, you know, practically every community in America's got some big blank wall like that and, you know, you're saying, well, what can I do with that? Well, maybe you could do something like this. You know, they finally had to put a sign up here because people were trying to drive into this thing. <laughs> this is called Tunnel Vision. It's in downtown Columbia, South Carolina. Uh, it's, a, it's a trompe loy fool the eye mural. All right, walkable places. I'm running out of time here, but walkable places create real estate value, and it's a lot to do with the supply and demand thing that I talked about. So I just want to tell you one story and show you a few more slides, and then I want to get to my wrap-up. So did a tour a couple months ago of Bentonville and Fayetteville, Arkansas. And um, so I'm driving down the interstate from Bentonville towards Fayetteville, and I saw this Waffle House out by the interstate exit, and I paid no attention to that Waffle House until I got down into downtown Fayetteville, and there's another brand-new Waffle House with three floors of housing on top of the Waffle House. And there's no parking in front of that building. I thought, well, that's kind of interesting. I've never seen a Waffle House with housing upstairs before. So I decided I was going to go over to the city hall and see if they could tell me anything about that Waffle House. And I found the city planner, and he said, yeah, we've already done a study about that Waffle House. And did you know that that downtown Waffle House is outperforming the one out on the highway? But more importantly, it's producing more taxes per acre, more jobs per acre, more residents per acre. There are 32 people who live upstairs above the Waffle House in downtown, but nobody lives above the Waffle House out on the highway. And by the way, if you're eating a lot of waffles, you probably need a walk after you go there. <laughs> so it's actually good for public health as well. And this is why the future belongs to mixed-use development, because it's outperforming single-use development, even though it's more complicated to do. And there's another concept in the real estate world. It's called the place-making dividend. It simply means people stay longer and come back more often and spend more money in places that attract their affection the place-making dividend. All right, so I want to end by just saying I've come to some conclusions over 40 years in the world of urban design and planning about why some communities succeed and one some fail. First and foremost, successful communities have a vision for the future. Some people might call that a plan for the future. And I can tell you, having grown up in Alabama, that there are a lot of people in this country who tell you they're against planning. And I always say to those people, then you tell me the name of any successful organization, institution, corporation, or community that doesn't plan for the future. Failing to plan simply means planning to fail. As the book of Proverbs says, without vision, the people will perish. 
And those successful visions always begin by inventorying your assets. And successful communities build all their plans, whether it's an economic development plan, a land use plan, a tourism plan, whatever, around the enhancement of their existing assets. Successful communities don't just use regulation, they use education, incentives, partnerships, and voluntary initiatives. Now, don't get me wrong, I didn't say I'm against regulation. Regulation prevents bad things from happening. It sets a minimum standard of conduct. But you need to use carrots, not just sticks, in order to create successful communities. Successful communities pick and choose. In many of the communities going downhill in America, the biggest impediment to better development is a fear of saying no to anything. Well, if you're afraid to say no to anything, you'll get the worst of everything. Communities that set no standards or low standards just compete right to the bottom. Communities that set high standards compete to the top because they know if you say no to bad development, you'll always get better development in its place. Successful communities consider what they look like. Successful communities have a quality of life lobby. Successful communities cooperate with their neighbors for mutual benefit. Let me just show you a couple of quick examples of a few communities that have used these principles. So welcome to Chattanooga, Tennessee. That was the one city of somebody growing up in Birmingham. We used to make fun of Chattanooga. What does that tell you? It used to be called the most polluted city in America. Nobody makes fun of Chattanooga anymore, though. It's now known as an international model for community revitalization. It all began with a vision for the future, and they decided to focus on two big things, downtown, because that's the heart and soul of any community, and the Tennessee River, because that was their most important natural asset. And when they started, every building in Chattanooga was like that, empty, vacant, abandoned. And they didn't pick the biggest project first, they picked the smallest project first, because they realized nothing succeeds like success. So don't pick the hardest thing to work on first, pick the easiest thing to work on first, because that takes, creates a sense of belief that you can do bigger and better projects, like the Outlet Mall in Chattanooga, which is an old warehouse buildings in the downtown. And then they created the first land trust in the south called the Tennessee River Gorge Trust to preserve the Tennessee River Gorge. Ten minutes from downtown Chattanooga. They saved their view and they all got a tax break too. You know, or then they said, let's build a, a trail all along the Tennessee River, both sides. And in 1972, when they first proposed this, $15 million, that was a lot of money in a small town. But I want to tell you something. How much something costs is not the most important question. It's the second most important question. The most important question facing any American community is what should we do? And I want to tell you that money always follows good ideas if those ideas come out of a consensus building process. And they built that trail, and it's attracted a billion dollars in new investment directly adjacent to it. And because they had a vision for the future, they were able to do some pretty remarkable things. This is the Walnut Street Bridge, obsolete highway bridge. Tennessee DOT was hankering to tear it down. And they'd set aside millions of dollars for its demolition. But Chattanooga said, no, we got a better idea. Let us use that same money to turn it into the nation's longest pedestrian bridge. Now connects downtown Chattanooga with a revitalized neighborhood on the other side of the river. Let's talk about public buildings. This is the uh, city hall in the Susan City, California, used to be. This was a community in 1985, voted the worst place to live in Northern California. <laughs> this was the only city hall in California that had to register with the Department of Motor Vehicles because they were in two double-wide trailers. You know, public buildings are kind of important, and they used to always be our most beautiful buildings, whether it was the courthouse, the city hall, the library, you name it. And they were almost always in our downtowns. And starting about 1960, in many places in America, we decided cheaper was better. You know what we've learned from that experience? We've learned that cheaper is simply cheaper. And so what they said in Susan City is, why would anybody invest in a community that wouldn't invest in themselves? And so they built a new city hall right on that same spot. And that began a decade-long transformation of that community. And by 1995, they were being voted one of the best places to live in downtown, I mean, in Northern California. But it all began with an investment in themselves. Successful communities inventory their assets. You know, sometimes those assets are pretty obvious, like Jackson, Wyoming, world-class scenery, unparalleled wildlife resources, or Annapolis, Maryland, unbelievable architectural and historical value. Sometimes the assets are not very obvious. Welcome to Lowell, Massachusetts. 1975 was a dying industrial city. Had an unemployment rate of 28%. Had never seen a single tourist, thought it had no assets. But what it had was abandoned textile mills, and now they've restored all of them. They've turned them into every possible thing you could imagine. Affordable housing, luxury condominiums. The University of Massachusetts at Lowell is back downtown in old restored warehouse buildings. So how about the Torpedo Factory in Alexandria? Now it's the largest art center in the United States. 
gets a couple of million visitors a year going to see 200 working artists and visit their galleries in this building. Or how about Columbus, Georgia? They had a terrible flood. They realized that adversity can breed opportunity, and so they built one of the great river walks in America that brought the city back to life. Or Paducah, Kentucky, that turned their flood walls into art galleries. Or how about Cincinnati in the Over the Rhine District, one of the toughest districts in America, where they've now replaced all their parking lots with people places. Or, you know, even in Akron that took the grain elevators and turned them into a Hilton hotel as part of the Quaker Oats Hilton project. You know, or how about Poughkeepsie, New York, probably the most challenged community in upstate New York. This is an abandoned rail bridge there. They've now turned it into a state park that's attracting 800,000 visitors a year. Successful communities use education, incentives, partnerships, and voluntary initiatives. Why do we educate? In order to reduce the need to regulate. Why do we educate? Because people won't embrace what they don't understand. Why do we educate? Because you, the citizens of any community, have a right to choose the future, but also to know what the choices are. We also need to use incentives, and there are lots of incentives besides free Cokes. You know, let me show you one, historic preservation tax credits. This used to be an abandoned brewery in the city of San Antonio until they used an historic preservation tax credit turned it into a great museum of art. You know, so there's all kinds of incentives you could use. Figure out where you want development and then make it easier to put, it think, put those things there. Voluntary initiatives. You know, some of you, I don't know if anybody here ever heard of the Tidy Town program in Ireland. Well, all the buildings in Ireland used to be just plain gray and they decided to pass out free paint, and they've painted these rainbow communities now. They decided that somebody from Yazoo City, Mississippi, went to Ireland and heard about that program. Look what they did. <laughs> they painted their way back to vitality in a voluntary initiative. Successful communities pick and choose among development pros. And I understand in successful communities have you know, a quality of life lobby that works to see that things get done. And I know it's not always easy doing things in small towns in America. <laughs> and I can guarantee you that no matter what you decide about the future of this community, there will be some people who will tell you they're against it. Uh, you know, can't do it, can't afford it, won't work, tried it already. And no is a powerful word in American communities. But I want to tell you a more powerful word, yes. Yes, we can make Lake Forest, Illinois, a better place to live in, to look at, to work in, to visit. Ladies and gentlemen, a pessimist sees difficulty in every opportunity. An optimist sees opportunity in every difficulty. And if you don't care who gets the, the credit, you get an awful lot done. I love this quote from Monty Python. Apart from sanitation, medicine, education, wine, public order, roads, irrigation, public health, and a freshwater system, what have the Romans ever done for us? <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, you can grow without destroying the things that people love. You know, vision counts, but implementation is priceless. Thank you for having me here tonight. And if you need to head home, that's fine too. I mean, but, but I'm happy to answer any questions you might have. Or... And I'm going to start off with, I'm going to take the liberty of uh, asking the first question. Okay. Which is, you know, I know you spent two or three hours this afternoon touring around Lake Forest. You saw everything from the lake to the savannah, yep. the hospital, and so forth. Um, in the context of what you just spent an hour or so eloquently educating us about, if you could pick the top two or three things that you think you see as opportunities or opportunities to take advantage of or opportunities to improve, uh, I, would, I, I think we'd all really appreciate hearing your view on that. I have a couple. Sit down and okay. uh, you guys can answer. A couple of things. First, my first recommendation would be put more housing in your downtown. Uh, and, you know, that's housing for, you know, People like me, empty nesters, retirees. You want your children to stay here? Give them a place they can live. You want the firemen to stay here, the teachers? Give them a place they can do, live. And by the way, if you live in a downtown, the average person spends $15,000 a year in the downtown, which means it helps all your retailers, okay? And you, 
have strict control on the design, what it looks like, fits in. You've got lots of room on empty parking lots. Do you know in Aspen, Colorado, and Jackson, Wyoming, and Steamboat Springs, places like that, even the gas stations now are in two-story buildings because the person who runs the gas station lives upstairs now instead of having to drive in. A Hilton Head you know, has a huge problem with you know, service workers. They all have to live off the island. They all have to drive in every day. And so they have a terrible traffic congestion. So they're building above all their convenience stores housing, okay? Nice looking housing. That'd be one thing I'd do. More housing in your downtown. Number two, you got great green space, great parks here. I'd do two things with those parks. Number one, I'd connect them with a system of walking trails and bike paths so it's easy to get from one part of the green space system to another. And then I'd do more things to activate those parks with more activities. You know, we just, we had our, our fall meeting last year in Dallas, Texas. They have a new park there called the Clyde Warren Park. They decked over three blocks of the interstate in downtown Dallas. They have 500 events a year in this park. 500 events, and, it's, and they'll, have, they'll have three or four events a day. They'll have a dog walking program. They'll have a, have a yoga class. They'll have, you know, so activate your parks. The third thing is something I already said, is use public art and historical things to tell the story of this community. You've got some incredible stories in this community. Make the stories manifest. And you've got some artists who could, you could work with to do some fun things to do. Create some murals, put up some sculptures, tell some stories. So those are, those are three things I'd immediately do. And I also think about how do you use this college, you know, to create like an incubator. You're probably already doing this. I think we, were, we talked about this, to get these students to think about how they could be engaged here. And then there's another thing. The last thing I would say is aging in place. So, uh, you know, AARP says that the average American senior wants to age in place. But that's hard to do in many places. So in my little town, Tacoma Park, Maryland, we're a, we have 19,000 people just like you do. We have a program called Lifelong Tacoma. So if you, if you notice, I've got some orthopedic issues. So I signed up for the Lifelong Tacoma pe program, and anytime we have a snowstorm, and now within an hour of the end of the snowstorm, I'll have five people in my driveway digging out my car, shoveling out my sidewalk. I don't pay a thing for that. But in return, I work on a mentor program to mentor young people in our city. We have walking school buses where retired senior citizens walk designated routes to school every day and take kids to walk with them so kids go out safely. So the idea is engaging young people with old people. And by the way, most senior citizens don't want to live with just a bunch of other old people, so multi-generational housing, which is something you could do in your downtown, is also part of that. So those are some of my suggestions. Other questions from any of you? Come on, I know somebody's got some other questions or comments. What, what do you think, or what, what do you guys think you should be doing? Yes, ma'am. Well, I can't hear you. The, the lakefront. Beautiful lakefront. I mean, the fact that you actually have public land along the lakefront is pretty remarkable and pretty great. You know, I, I tell you, I have a brother who's a doctor, and he lives in uh, Columbia, South Carolina. And some years ago, I went to visit him, and we were on, uh, we were on a sailboat. He has a sailboat, and he was on Lake uh, Murray, which is the largest lake in the state of South Carolina. And he said a very interesting thing. We were sort of like sailing around and drinking wine and, you know, and he says, uh, I said, how's the fishing on the lake? And he said, oh, it's great, except uh, you can't go fishing here unless you have a boat because the entire shoreline of the lake is privatized. There's no public access to the biggest lake in the state of South Carolina. That's one of the things that, you know, in, in Alabama we, were, we privatized everything because of segregation. And so I had just come back from Minneapolis, Minnesota, where they have 18 lakes and all the lakes, all the land around all the lakes is public land. They're all connected with a parkway system. And all the most valuable real estate is the real estate facing the lakes. So, you know, that's a great thing. One of the things I thought about is that park that you got down by the lake, that beautiful park. Put some artwork in that park. Put some sculptures in there. Have a, Place some placemakers down there. Have some activities down there. Have some classes in the morning. Some of those, so activating those. Sorts. But it's a great that you have that because so many places don't have public access to the water. And I'll tell you a great story about this. So Joe Riley, the former mayor of, of Charleston, the dean of American mayors, he was, he was reelected uh, 10 times for four-year terms, 40 years, founder of the Mayor's Institute for City Design. And if you went to Charleston, you know they have two rivers, the Ashley River and the Cooper River. And the Cooper River was their industrial waterfront. And so it was all these abandoned factories and, you know, stuff like that. And 
one day this guy shows up and said he wanted to build these high-rise condos on the river, and all the economic development people were like super excited about this. Oh, yeah, we're going to put these high-rise condos on the river. And they went to the mayor, and he said, no, 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 we're not going to do that. He said, what are you talking about? He said, no, we're going to give the best of the city to everyone. We're going to put parks along that river. And they have put world-class parks along the Cooper River. And you know where the most valuable land in all of South Carolina is today? It's the land next to those parks. And now everybody can get to the river, see the river, use the river, and the value goes way back in to the city because of that. And if you just put the high-rise condos right on the river, yeah, those would be valuable condos, but nobody else could you know, benefit from that value. So your waterfront, very important. Yes, ma'am. Right. Well, one idea I had today was riding into the, uh, the industrial, uh, I mean, the office park over there. Yeah. Well, that's a place you could put some housing and some commercial activities, maybe a, a hotel, maybe some restaurants. You know, as I said to, earlier in the talk, the, the largest office park, research park, whatever you want to call it, in America is in Raleigh, North Carolina. It's the Research Triangle. They just went through a five-year up to called it's called Research Park 2.0, their problem is they have 40,000 employees and they're all driving in and out every day. They didn't have any restaurants, so they had three rush hours a day, morning, evening, and lunch, because everybody had to drive to lunch. So now they're saying, well, now they're putting commercial development, beautifully done, landscaped well, and housing in the office park. That's something that you could do. I thought about it also at the hospital. They've got beautiful grounds, maybe some really attractive housing for nurses or for, you know, do even doctors. Probably doctors could probably afford some of your other houses, but the nurses couldn't. You know, it's interesting, I was in, in Nantucket, and Nantucket, they got so pricey there that they, they have a hospital in Nantucket, and they have to fly in half the hospital staff every day from the mainland because nobody could afford to live there. School teachers were all leaving. They couldn't afford to live there, so they used school board property to build housing for school teachers. You know, so there's some things like that that you, you could do, and those are the places where... You know, you're not putting your housing next to your big single-family housing. You're putting in a place where you already got, you know, activity and things like that. So that that's would be my suggestion about that. Any other thoughts? Yes, ma'am. Right, yep. Sure. Right. Right. Well, I, there's a couple of things. First of all, I mean, there's some places that I think are worth, you know, worth preserving, landmarking them, saving them, et cetera, even if you had to buy them. But, you know, this is an issue in a lot of very high-income communities. Nantucket, this was an issue in Nantucket. And by the way, most of the houses in Nantucket are only occupied two to three months out of the year. This is the south of the Battery in Charleston, South Carolina, same problem. Uh, but so what we've, they've done in Nantucket, and they're doing in a number of other places, is that they've essentially allowed the condominiumization of these manor houses. You save the outside, but you allow for a condominium set, set sort of project on the inside. So you could have four or five units in a huge massive house. They would, you know, if you go to the main line outside of Philadelphia, this is the same thing they do there. They have a, a big land trust there called the Natural Lands Trust. It's worked with the state owners for years on essentially development, and this is the biggest issue you have, because almost all development here will be redevelopment, because virtually you have no, very, very little bit of redevelop, you know, land, you know, big plots left. So thinking about how you could integrate something new, and you could, there, there's some beautiful projects that I've seen on estate properties where they actually have added a number of units of housing, but they look like they're the, they look like they're stables, or they look like they were the, you know, the gatehouse, or th things like that, and then they take the mansion, and they've turned it into several units. 
I mean, you come to, you go to Calorama neighborhood in D.C., we have these unbelievable mansions there. I mean, just like you've got here, and a lot of those are actually, but we have a strict preservation law, so you can't tear them down or anything, but they've turned into, so that's something you could figure out, and there's some other communities to do that. I'd work with Illinois Landmarks Foundation uh, that has got some experience with that sort of thing. Okay, time for one or two more. Anything else? Uh, yes, ma'am, in the back. Two, right, two questions right here. Right? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Yeah, well, the, the, the Urban Land Institute has a lot of experience working on what we would call white elephant buildings, mental hospitals, you know, veterans' homes, even prisons, and figuring out ways to redevelop them in a way that's profitable and that will, will work. Uh, I would, you know, we have a program that's called uh, te Technical Advisory Panels. We could actually put together a group of experts who could come and look at a property like that and figure out what might work. Uh, because there's, that's been done in many parts uh, of, the, of the country. You know, I was just up in Buffalo, New York, where H.H. H. Richardson's uh, built this, uh, this incredible mental health hospital, designed this mental health hospital, it's now a boutique hotel. Um, you know, there, there are things that you can, you can do, uh, and, uh, you know, it just really depends. Every, every site is a little different. You know, won't, every, the same thing won't work every place, but, you know, they're, they're, so you try to tailor the solution to the site, uh, and there's, I think, some things to do. Yes, ma'am, you had a question? Yeah, I'm interested in what you were talking about, the, the particular um, kind of dark spaces, and then the Yeah, well, you know, so uh, San Mateo County, California, that's the Silicon Valley, right? And uh, they pay the highest starting salaries for teachers in the United States, $70,000 to start for a teacher right out of, you know, education school. But you know, at a $70,000 salary, you can't afford to live anywhere near San Mateo County, California. So all the teachers were having to live in the East Bay, commute for two hours, so they had a huge turnover of teachers. And so what they decided to do was similar to what they did in Nantucket. They used school board land to build housing for teachers. And, and I think there's some things like that you could do where, you, you know, you think about the people who you do want here. Do you want your teachers? Do you want your city employees? Do you want your police to live here? Do you want your city manager to live here? Whoever, you know, in so many communities that we, you just price all those people out. So thinking about ways to provide some housing so some of those people could live here and do it in a place that's appropriate for that kind of use. And what, also what happens is when you have different kinds of people, you create more vitality in terms of, you know, things going outside. I mean, I love these splash pads because they bring kids out. And the kids come with their moms, you know, et cetera. And then people, like, as I said before, love to watch other people doing things. And so there's a new project in Houston on the side of an old mall called City Center and they have all these restaurants designed around a square, and these parents come, and they're all sitting around having wine and eating dinner around this square, and the kids are all running around in the middle. Uh, and, uh, you know, that's the kind of thing you ought to be thinking about, how you might be able to do a few things like that, and that sort of would help everybody, I think, in the, in the long run. And, and if you don't start thinking about things like that, you, you know, your young people just aren't going to come back. They're all going to, you know, they're going to go to Chicago and interstate, and if they move out of Chicago, they're just going to go up to Evanston, maybe, you know, or something like that. So think about how, and you know, the other big problem is, you know, one of the, I just, we didn't, we didn't really talk about this, but one of the biggest drivers of real estate development in the United States is the quality of infrastructure. And, you know, all we've done for most places for years is build wider roads. We don't, you know, I, this is one thing I learned living in Europe. They don't, like, hate cars in Europe, like, especially in Germany. They invented the, auto, the interstate system, basically, called Autobahn. The difference is they don't have to use the car all the time because they've got world-class public transportation. You know, they got trains that go to every small town 10 times a day. I, I took a train from Berlin to Hamburg. There's 25 trains a day, and it go 240 kilometers an hour. 
You know, we only have decent train service one place in America, it's between Washington and New York. And did you know that, all, that Amtrak carries more people than all the airlines combined? Because there's, and not because it's high-speed rail. It's not high-speed rail, but it's frequent rail. So the train goes every half hour all day long. You don't even have to think about it. You just go down and get on a train. Who would fly a plane to Philadelphia from Washington? You have to go to the airport, park your car, go through security, hope the weather's good, blah, blah. You take the train. So, I mean, we need to be thinking about things like infrastructure investments. If you had more express trains from here into downtown, you'd have more young people living here. And so that, but that takes, you know, that doesn't happen overnight, and it takes some political will to make that happen. I don't want to keep you any longer. I'll be happy to stick around and answer questions informally. I hope I've given you some food for thought. Thank you for coming. <laughs>